Okay, I want to thank um, Lucas or whoever invited me to, for, to give a speaking slide. So this is just to wake you up and get you interested in glycosylation. So I'm going to start with um, background material on glycosylation. So this is textbook stuff. There's, if you look in a textbook, you'll, you'll read there's two types of glycosylation, N-linked glycosylation, linked through the nitrogen and asparagine. And the two things to know about that is there's a sequence motif, asparagine, anything but proline, and then serine or threonine. And there's a common core. N-glycans tend to be fairly big, and they always start with a... Um, this five monosaccharide core. And if you need a little guide for what the monosaccharides are, it's shown here. And from the mass spec point of view, the two circles are equivalent. They have exactly the same mass. They're both hexose. And the two little boxes are equivalent. They're both hexanac, um, exactly the same mass again. And then the other major type of glycosylation is O-linked glycosylation linked through the oxygen in serine or threonine. There's no consensus motif. There's kind of motify things with a lot of S's and P's in certain, in mucin-type domains. And there's many cores, so there's no one conserved core. Now, a more recently discovered third type of glycosylation is very simple. It's called O-glycnac, and the glycans are all the same. It's a single glycnac. It's attached through the oxygen in serine or threonine. So it's uh, attached like an O glycosylation. It's quite different. It's a regulatory PTM. It comes on and off, and there's always discussion of what's the interplay with phosphorylation. So glycopeptide identification is notoriously difficult. Um, one reason is that each glycosylation site has tens or even hundreds of different glycans on it. So the signal from that peptide, a peptide carrying a glycosylation site, is split between many species. And so none of them are very ab abundant. So you're looking at small, low abundance uh, precursors. And there are also, you know, there's only a few glycosylation sites in most gly glycopeptides. So it's advantageous to enrich for glycopeptides. Another probably even more important reason that glycopeptide analysis is difficult is that glycopeptides are not very mass spec friendly. They tend to give poor fragmentation. In CID fragmentation, the glycan fragments tend to fly off very easily, and you get very little peptone, peptide backbone fragmentation. ETD tends to be better. You get the peptide uh, backbone fragmentation, which, of course, is crucial for making the peptide identification. But ETD, you need a, a more highly charged precursor, so that's one limiting factor. You also won't see the glycan fragments, so you won't know for sure that it's a, uh, a glycopeptide you're looking at. Nevertheless, simple samples can be analyzed, and a lot of groups have done this. I was part of one that looked at the zona pellucida protein, so that's the egg. Um, and there were, I think, four, if I remember right, there were four potential N glycosylation sites. Only one of them turned out to be populated, but it was very populated with many, many different uh, glyco, uh, glycans on it. And in this case, we were using QTOF data, and we would get a few lucky spectra where we did have peptide fragmentation. So that identified which peptide was carrying glycosylation. But then most of the IDs, most of those 100 plus glycoforms we, are, we identified, it was the precursor mass making the identification. And of course, this doesn't scale to extremely complex samples. So that's the subject of today's talk. How complex can we go for glycopeptide identification? So we'd like to look at samples with uh, potentially hundreds of proteins and thousands or even tens of thousands of glycosylation sites, of potential glycosylation sites, which determines the size of the search. So Rosa Viner and colleagues at Thermo Fisher have um, pioneered some advances in data acquisition, which have made glycopeptide analysis uh, much more tractable. So the first idea is label the peptides with tandem mass tags to improve the charge 
to increase the charge and hence improve the ETD spectra. And this isn't isotopic quantitation. This is just the TMT zero, so no expensive isotopes. We're really just using it to increase the charge. The second idea is product-dependent ETD. So you uh, take an HCD scan, you look for a, a characteristic oxonium ion, 204 is hexnac plus a proton, and then that triggers the ETD spectrum. And you can, of course, use alternating HCD ETD, but this product dependent is nice because it's especially efficient. You don't get an ETD scan except if it's a glycopeptide. And then for the search, you have the advantage of knowing that all the ETD spectra are almost guaranteed to contain a, gly uh, a glycopeptide. So here's an example of an HCD spectrum. This is an unusually good one. This is literally one in 5,000 spectra. I picked the best one in a data set with 5,000 HCD scans. And in this case, you do have plenty of, uh, you have a, a series Y1 through Y8. And um, the, the glycan, you see the, the biggest peaks in the spectrum are the glycan peaks. And uh, here they are. The biggest one is hexnac hex. There's a big one for hexnac hex sialic. It, this is the glycan. It's a you know, pretty common sialylated glycan. Here's the corresponding ETD spectrum. So it's triggered by the, the oxonium ions we saw. And this uh, is an even better spectrum. It has uh, quite a few uh, C and Z ions for making the identification. This one has something. Uh, that's unusually good. It has C8 and C9 carrying the glycan, so you don't always see those. Okay, so that's the end of the background part. I'll now tell you something about the bioinformatics. So we have a search engine too, just like all the ones that Sante listed. Um, it has a few unique features, and I'll explain those now. Um, one of them is we have a uh, checkbox. We wanted it easy enough for uh, full professors to use. Just check the box and it'll say, uh, it'll do N glycopeptide search. I haven't gotten Pavel to try it yet. Um, an, alternatively, we have a box where you can type in and do your own modifications. And we let the user customize his search quite a bit. So for example, if you type in N glycan and give it a mass and say common one, it will search for one per peptide, at most one per peptide. So that's what that checkbox does also. It's at most one per peptide, but it has a big list of uh, N-glycan masses. But um, O-glycosylation, for example, tends to cluster. So it's like phosphorylation. So it's quite common to see a number of O-glycosylation sites close together. So a more appropriate search, rather than one per peptide for O-glycosylation, is allow three per peptide or in this case, it's O-glycnac, which also clusters. But what I said was also true for more general O-glycosylation as well. We also have another keyword, rare, where you're allowed a total. Typically, we allow a total of at most one rare uh, modification per peptide. So this avoids some of the combinatorial explosion. You can throw on 20 or 30 modifications and make them all rare and you get more of a, a linear slowdown rather than exponential. And we have save and load, because you might have spent a long time customizing your search. I won't say too much about the scoring algorithm. We've published a lot of this. Um, we're now commercial, but, so I'm not going to say deep, dark secrets. But um, we do use peak intensities. We, I don't think we train 1,700 models. But um, for ETD, Bionic is smart about when to predict the C minus 1 and Z plus 1 ions. Um, C CID and HCD spectra tend to be more complicated than ETD, so there's a lot more tricks you can play. Within Bionic, it knows, it knows how to map uh, glycan masses to composition, so it knows which glycan fragments to predict. And mostly, uh, the glycan fragments don't really vary that much from uh, glycan to, uh, glycopeptide to glycopeptide, because they almost all contain hexnac and hex. But 
whether it contains a sialic acid or not, we can see that from the glycan fragments, so that's helpful. There, are, you may also see the bare peptide or bare peptide plus hexnac. Those aren't common, but when you see them, they're very useful because that gives you the peptide mass and the glycan mass, so you can separate them. Now I'll show three biological examples, uh, all of them quite complex, so I'm going to answer the question that yes, we can do uh, complex samples. We got all the samples uh, from Rosa Viner and colleagues. Um, so the first one is ideal training data. It's human blood plasma, very well studied. The glycoproteins in human blood plasma are very well, uh, very well known. And this is that uh, data. It's the product-dependent ETD triggered by the oxonium ions in the HCD and it's TMT labeled, so it uses the two ideas from Thermo. So the 224 is the TMT tag, it's a fixed modification on uh, free amino groups. Uh, this had some methionine oxidation, so we throw that in as common too, and then I just check the box. And out of 2400 ETD spectra, we get identifications that we believe on about 800 of the uh, spectra so that's counting duplicates, so that's the PSM level. And we're seeing about 70 N glycosylation sites on about 50, 50 proteins. And they check out, we can go to Uniprot and say, and it says yes indeed, and it gives a reference for each of these. So you might think, well, 800 out of 2400 isn't so good, but the spectra we're not identifying are really getting pretty low quality. Uh, Julian Saba at Thermo said it's Julian level, which he said was the highest compliment he could give. And then it's worth asking, is it precursor mass that's making the identifications? Um, and you can do a back of the envelope calculation, and the search is too big to be getting these identifications from precursor mass alone. You'd need to get the monoisotopic mass, the monoisotopic peak picked correctly every time, and have precursor about, or even better than one half part per million to get these identifications from precursor mass alone. Of course, precursor mass is doing quite a bit of work. It's helping quite a bit. But it's, you need fragmentation as well. And you can look at um, the two columns I have labeled here. The part per million error is, it's below four parts per million all the one, on all the ones I'm showing here after we've done software recalibration to improve the precursor error and the uh, monoisotopic mass is getting picked only about half, half the time correctly. And, uh, you know, that is improvable, but you can't get to 0% uh, to error there. It's, I've looked at them, and I can't do it. Second example, this is a heavily O-glycosylated protein. So this is a purified protein, and you can see the collaborators here. Um, we did a two-pass search strategy. These searches, um, Bionic's great, but when we do a, a difficult search, it helps to have a focused database, so rather than searching all the human pro, uh, proteome. And in this case, I didn't, I'd never seen significant O glycosylation before, so I checked the end. Oh, and by the way, if you go to Uniprot KB, it will tell you there's an end glycosylation site on this protein as well. So we're searching simultaneously for O and N. So I checked the N box, I checked the O box, and then I threw, threw in the uh, O glycans that Uniprot KB told me were the major O glycans on this protein. And I put them in as common three because, as I said, O glycosylation is known to cluster. So here are the structures. And um, whenever we put in a glycan, we put in the glycan plus sodium. Um, the sialylated glycans especially attract sodium, and so they're, they're very often seen with, the, with sodium. Um, in this case, again, we're identifying about a third of the spectra, um, and again, the ones we're not identifying look pretty bad to the eye. Um, and this, although it's nominally a purified protein, it's not well purified. There's lots of other proteins in there, including glycopeptides from those proteins. Uh, here's an ETD spectrum of, uh, so I think I jumped over one. No? 
Anyway, here's an ETD spectrum of um, uh, a peptide with three glycosylations, three O-glycans on it. We don't have fragmentation up here in between these two, so it's possible that the mass is split differently between these two sites. But if we infer from Uniprot K, if we trust Uniprot KB, this is the most likely identification. Um, on the elites, but not on other orbitraps, you can do uh, ETD followed by orbitrap mass analysis and get great spectra. I wanted to show this one for two reasons. One, the glycan is different. It's not one that I saw in the Uniprot KB site. It, it wasn't mentioned. Um, of course, we only know the mass, but the mass is hexnac, hex, fucose, and here's one possibility. Um, the other reason I wanted to show it is it's just such a spectacular spectrum. Uh, complete fragmentation. The fragment masses are all within 3 ppm. Okay, the third example in one minute is an O-glicnac, so it's the third type of O-glycosylation. Um, I wanted to show an example of a kind of customized search you can do with Bionic. This one has a lot of, this is published data from um, Peng Zhao et al. at uh, CCRC at U of Georgia, and it's a collaboration with Thermo. Um, but this one had a fair number of sample preparation artifacts, pyroglue, overalkylation, and so forth. They're not of interest, but you want to make the identifications because otherwise you'll miss things. And uh, so I'm going to contrast that with a more conventional search that you do with a more conventional search engine where you can't do this fine control of the modifications. Uh, Peng Zhao et al. used Sequest mascot and protein prospector followed by a certain amount of manual curation. So here's something they missed. Be oh, and one more thing. We did a, we allowed non-specific cleavage at the end terminus and they did a fully specific. I'll just show something they missed because their search was more limited. Um, so it's semi-specific. One thing to know is in HCD, uh, O-glycans tend to fly off completely. So we know it's an O-glycan, but all these annotated peaks are, with the, uh, are without the plus 203. So it's as if it were unmodified. So we can't place the modification at all. But the ETD places it. It's placed somewhat tenuously because we have only one peak, C4, that disambiguates this from having the 203 on the uh, threonine in the fifth position. I want to leave you with two things. The um, large-scale glycopeptide identification is feasible. I showed you three big searches for the three types of glycosylation. The other thing I want to leave you with is we didn't tweak or train bionic specially for glycopeptides. Uh, really, Thermo just dumped data on me and said, can you do it? And, Turned out we could. So uh, all of the improvements in Bionic apply to other difficult types of searches. And that's it. Oh, except for acknowledgments. Come, oh, come visit us at booth 85. Protein Metrics is these three guys at the bottom. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall. Is there time for at least one question? Um, what, um, in, uh, I'll make it more general. I was going to say within the thermo uh, line of instruments, but what, what platforms are required to use your search to, uh, or can your search uh, uh, software support. Um, okay, so our search software supports anything. Um, so, you know, we take in data from all types of instruments. But if you're asking what's the minimal platform to do um, high quality glycopeptide identification from complex samples, uh, well, you can ask the thermo people, and I think the answer is elite, elite. <laughs> But no, any orbitrap will do glycopeptide analysis because, uh, but you know, each generation's better than the one before. Um, 
I think so. I mean, we can do it on QTOF too. So it's it's just your how complex you can go is uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna be limited if if you have no ETD. ETD is is very uh, you know is a, a very very big advance, especially for site, site localization for oglike oscillation. Okay. 